I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare, Series 2, Podcast H, Romeo and Juliet. The rhetorical device called the oxymoron, which unites opposites in a single phrase, gives Romeo and Juliet its essential structure. The play holds in exquisite tension two of the most extreme and paradoxical opposites in human experience, love and death. In the self-immolating love of the lovers is contained not only erotic passion for, and total commitment to, another human being, but also all hope for a future of fruitfulness and peace. And within the death-dealing feud of the families is contained not only the most poignant loss that death can deal, namely the early demise of promising youth, but also the roots of disharmony, strife, and warfare. The relation between these two principles, love and death, is not merely one of juxtaposition. In the context of the family feud, the love of the lovers arises out of the hatred that is a kind of death in life and death in society, and the lovers' self-sacrificial deaths expiate the death-dealing hate of the feud and resolve it into love when the fathers make peace at the end. The play thus becomes a powerful early example of Shakespeare's ingenious imaginative capacity to bring paradoxical opposites into the unified experience of a single and moving drama. Already at this early stage of his career, the play is probably written in about 1595 to 96, Shakespeare gives us perhaps the most compelling empathic experience of the power, beauty, and magic of young love in all our literature. And in the same play, he gives us an equally compelling experience of grief at the most hideous and unbearable loss that death can deliver, the death of the beautiful and promising young. Detached from the vociferous grief of Capulet, Lady Capulet, and the nurse in Act 4, Scene 5, because we know Juliet is not really dead, we suffer all the more grief ourselves when we see the two lovers really dead in Act 5, Scene 3. That their deaths are presented as both avoidable and at the same time inevitable heightens the agony and is another instance of the tragic union of opposites. Despite the presence of Friar Lawrence, the play does not provide us much consolation in the Christian afterlife that increasingly suffuses Shakespeare's later dramas. The lovers are never thought of as damned for their suicides. The deaths of the lovers are horrible to us, not because of the despair in their souls that leads to damnation, as in the characters Richard III, Othello, and Macbeth, but because of the horror of their mere loss to one another and to us. If there is any significant Christian implication in the play, it lies in the fact that their deaths become expiations of the family feud, as if the lover's mutual love were itself the sacrifice of love on the altar of death. That they rise again in statues of gold is but pitiful consolation. The play is a tragedy that mitigates nothing of the promise of young love and nothing of the pain at its loss. This representation of the agonizing paradox of love and death is what I mean by saying that the oxymoron is the essential structure of the play. But there are also passages which make specific rhetorical use of the oxymoron. In the first scene of the play, Romeo, a Montague, suffering from the rejection of his love by Rosaline, a Capulet, sees evidence of the street brawl between the followers of the two families. He says, in lines 176 to 182, Why then, O brawling love, O loving hate, O anything of nothing first create, O heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms, feather of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health, still waking sleep that is not what it is. This love feel I, that feel no love in this. Similarly, when Juliet first hears that her new husband, a Montague, has killed her cousin Tybalt, like her a Capulet, she cries in Act 3, Scene 2, Lines 75 to 79, 
beautiful tyrant, fiend angelical, dove-feathered raven, wolvish ravening lamb, despised substance of divinest show, just opposite to what thou justly seemst, a damned saint, an honorable villain. These oxymorons arise from the very substance of the drama, as love has arisen amidst and despite the feud of the two houses. Related to the oxymoron are the antitheses in Friar Lawrence's meditation in Act 2, Scene 3, Lines 15-16, to 16, on the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities. His speech, expressed in rhymed couplets, is built of opposites. Morn, night, clouds, light, baleful weeds, and precious juiced flowers, womb, tomb, vileness, good, virtue, vice, poison, medicine. The speech is a good example of variation, the same idea repeated in a variety of ways. I discuss this technique in Session 4 of Chapter 4 in Series 1. It also illustrates the poetical use of metaphorical correspondence, treating the twofold nature of plants and flowers as analogous to the twofold nature of man. Friar Lawrence says, in lines 27 to 30, Two such opposed kings encamp them still, meaning always, in man as well as herbs, grace and rude will. And where the worser is predominant, full soon the canker death eats up that plant. I discuss the whole speech in detail in Session 3 of Chapter 7 in Series 1 to illustrate this doctrine of correspondence. Just as within the infant rind of this weak flower poison hath residence and medicine power, lines 23 to 24, so man is the arena of a psychomachia, an interior spiritual war between the gifts given and virtues taught by God and the lower willfulness that leads to sin, of which death, both in Adam and in every man, was believed to be the consequence. I will discuss psychomachia further in Podcast K on Othello. Hamlet's phrase, quintessence of dust, in Hamlet Act II, Scene 2, Line 308, and the prince's speech there gives a related image. Romeo and Juliet is filled with many other pointed antitheses. There are contrasts between youth and age, intense feeling and outward formality, individual passion and social convention, meeting and separation, union and interruption, kissing and dying, day and night, sun and moon, stars and star crossing, dawns and endings, five of them, passion and reason, sacrifice and reconciliation, comedy and tragedy. The foils to Romeo's and Juliet's idealism are the satirical cynicism of Mercutio and the practical cynicism of the nurse. The magnetic passion of love that draws Romeo and Juliet together is mirrored by the magnetic passion of conflict that draws Mercutio and Tybalt to their fateful encounter. Friar Lawrence, who at Act Two, Scene Three, Line Ninety Four, advises Romeo to move wisely and slow, later bolts from the tomb in a fright at Act Five, Scene Three, Line One Fifty Nine. Romeo goes from using a fateful blade on Tybalt to using poison on himself. Juliet from swallowing fateful pseudo poison for Romeo's sake to using a blade on herself. Reversals abound. Romeo's love is Rosalind, then Juliet. Fights break out, and the prince stops them. Tybalt flies into a rage that Capulet suppresses. Capulet arranges a wedding, suddenly changes its date, then flies into a rage at Juliet. Benvolio and then Romeo try to make peace, and Tybalt, Mercutio, and Romeo turn to violence. In an alchemical transformation, the dead lovers are turned to gold in the final reconciliation of the families, and the feuding city is turned to peace. And, of course, prose alternates with verse, as well as blank verse, with rhymed. To the rhetorical figures of oxymoron and antithesis is joined a manifold use of Shakespeare's storehouse of rhetorical art. 
The play is written in the period in which Shakespeare was energetically discovering, among other things, the power of rhetorical figures to convey intense meaning and experience. Other plays in this period include Richard III, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Richard II, all exhibiting extensive and consciously elaborated figurative rhetoric. In Romeo and Juliet, notice the prose Stichomythia at Act 1, Scene 1, lines 44 to 62, and at Act 2, Scene 4, lines 52 to 87, and the verse Stichomythia between Romeo and Benvolio at Act 1, Scene 1, lines 160 to 172, and between Juliet and Paris at Act 4, Scene 1, lines 18 to 36. Other figures of speech that form the poetic substance of this play include, among others, the following daunting list. Anaphora, Antanaclesis, Antimetaboli, Antistasis, Aphorismus, Aporia, Apostrophe, Asteismus, Asyndeton, Diacopy, Epitheton, Epizuxis, Hippozuxis, Lytotes, Meiosis, Paranomasia, Pleonasmus, Plosi, Polyptoton, Polysyndeton, Threnos, Tmesis, and Zugma. There is one more rhetorical device that is essential to the play's effect on the audience. That is the sonnet. Traditionally a vehicle of love, the sonnet form here rhetorically intensifies the love tragedy. The prologues to Acts 1 and 2 take the form of sonnets, and the play ends in a curtal sonnet. More crucially, the first words spoken by Romeo and Juliet in Act 1, Scene 5, lines 93 to 106, take the form of a sonnet. He takes her hand in his and says the first quatrain. Romeo. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims, ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Juliet then responds with the second quatrain. Juliet. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Palmers are pilgrims, originally those who had made pilgrimage to Jerusalem, of which the symbol that they carried was the palm branch. When they met one another, their form of greeting was to touch the palms of their hands. Then the third quatrain is divided between them three lines to Romeo, and one to Juliet. Romeo. Have not saints' lips and holy palmers too? Juliet. I, pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Romeo. O oh, then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray. Grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. This is his request to move from holding her hand, to kissing her lips. Then, moving toward becoming one, the couple shares the couplet and its rhyme. Juliet. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Romeo. Then move not while my prayer's effect I take. Romeo then kisses Juliet, though many editors erroneously put the stage direction for the kiss a line below. It must come here, as the climax of the sonnet leading to it. And so the lovers meet in a mutual love expressed in a mutual sonnet. It is one of the sweetest touches of the play. But the play is an oxymoron. The placement of the kiss at the end of the sonnet is followed and confirmed by the beginning of another sonnet, uttered in pursuit of a second kiss. Again its first quatrain is shared by the couple. Romeo. Thus from my lips by thine my sin is purged. Juliet. Then have my lips the sin that they have took. Romeo. Sin from my lips? O oh, trespass sweetly urged. Give me my sin again. After these three feet of the line, Romeo impetuously kisses Juliet again, and she responds with the quatrain's last two feet. Juliet. 
you kiss by the book. That is, he kisses both methodically and by rhetorical conceit. But this second sonnet is interrupted after its first quatrain. The sonnet form, signifying love, and complete in their first meeting, is now broken off. By what? And what does the interruption signify? The nurse says, at line 111, Madam, your mother craves a word with you, and her prose injection into the verse of the sonnet leads immediately to Romeo's rhyming couplet of recognition at lines 117 to 118. Is she a Capulet? O oh, dear account, my life is my foe's debt. In other words, the second sonnet is cut short by the fact of the feud, by hate, by the threat of death. The passage is thus to be read both literally and symbolically. The first sonnet is both an instance and a symbol of the wooing of the lovers, the first kiss a symbol of their wedding, the second kiss a symbol of its consummation, and the abrupt interruption of the second sonnet a symbol of the early death of their marriage because of the very fact that interrupts their second sonnet, namely that Romeo is a Montague and Juliet a Capulet. The symbolic second kiss then prefigures the tragic last kiss when Romeo will say, at Act 5, Scene 3, Line 120, Thus, with a kiss, I die. The passage stands as a representation in little of the structure of the whole play. In the context of the death-dealing feud, the lovers meet, love, marry, consummate their marriage, and die young their marriage and their lives cut short, like the prefiguring second sonnet. The use of the sonnet form reappears at the end of the play, at Act 5, Scene 3, Lines 296 to 310, when we get that form broken up into internal rhyme, rhymed couplets, and unrhymed lines in a series divided between the two patriarchs. Capulet O brother Montague, give me thy hand. This is my daughter's jointure, for no more can I demand. Montague, but I can give thee more, for I will raise her statue in pure gold, that while Verona by that name is known, there shall no figure at such rate be set as that of true and faithful Juliet. Capulet, as rich shall Romeo's by his ladies lie, Poor Sacrifices of Our Enmity. In Capulet's speech, we have an internal rhyme, hand, demand. Then Montague exactly rhymes with Capulet, more, more, and ends with the rhyme, set, Juliet. Then Capulet adds an I rhyme, lie, enmity. Finally, the prince concludes the play with a curtle sonnet, the last quatrain and couplet of a partial sonnet about the woeful death of the lovers, as if he is completing the interrupted sonnet of the lovers' first meeting. A glooming peace this morning with it brings, the sun for sorrow will not show his head. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things, some shall be pardoned and some punished. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. As in A Midsummer Night's Dream the rhetorical figures incarnate the play's lyricism, so in Romeo and Juliet they are the form by which the magical power of love and the horrible power of its enemy death reach deeply into our experience. Now here's a discussion of one of the key speeches of the play. At Act 1, Scene 4, Lines 53 to 95, Mercutio's wild and much-beloved Queen Mab speech engages in extreme elaboration to illustrate the thin, inconstant substance of dreams, the children of an idle brain begot of nothing but vain fantasy. The point of the speech is to disparage and debunk the premonitions of Romeo expressed in lines 106 to 111. My mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars 
shall bitterly begin his fearful date with this night's revels, and expire the term of a despised life closed in my breast by some vile forfeit of untimely death. This prophecy turns out to be true, as does Juliet's premonition at Act 3, Scene 5, lines 54 to 57. Juliet. O God, I have an ill-divining soul. Methinks I see thee now thou art so low as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight fails, or thou lookst pale. Mercutio's debunking is in keeping with his role throughout, which is with a reductive wit to set off by contrast the earnest, idealistic depth of passion in Romeo and in Juliet. His satirical collar is a foil as well to Tybalt's earnest collar. The undermining of seriousness by Mercutio, the man of humors, operates even when he is mortally wounded himself. In Act 3, Scene 1, at lines 93 to 98, he says, A scratch, a scratch. Ask for me tomorrow, and you shall find me a grave man. The pun on grave serves to punctuate the use of the rhetorical figure called meiosis, belittling with a demeaning word or phrase. Now here are four specific notes to help you in your reading. 1. In line 11 of the prologue to Act 1, which but their children's end naught could remove, but here means except for. The rage between the two families could not be removed by anything but their children's end. 2. At Act 2, Scene 2, in the famous line 33, Wherefore art thou Romeo? Wherefore means why. Why are you Romeo? Implying, why must you be a Montague? 3. At Act 2, Scene 4, line 37, Mercutio says of Romeo, Without his row like a dried herring. This is a complex and ribald pun. Row is the milt or sperm fluid of a male fish. Dried herring would have had its row removed as a delicacy. Compare with shad row and Falstaff's phrase shotten herring in Henry the Fourth, Part One, Act Two, Scene Four, Line One Thirty. Mercutio presumes that Romeo is creeping home depleted, either because he has slept with Rosaline and is depleted of semen, or more likely because his spirits a word synonymous with semen, as in line 1 of Sonnet 129, are depressed because of not being able to sleep with her. But Mercutio is also punning on Romeo's name. Romeo is creeping home in woe, saying, Mio, that is, O oh, me, as if without the first syllable of his name, Ro, which is also the first syllable of Rosalind's name. 4. At Act 5, Scene 3, Line 295, in the phrase, A brace of kinsmen, a brace means a pair. The prince is referring to Mercutio and Paris, who are both relatives of his. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.